Let's continue talking about the concept of a standard candle, and then we'll get into the idea of look-back time in astronomy. A standard candle is something in astronomy, an object in space, that we know the absolute magnitude or luminosity for, and is also very bright. Examples of these include Cepheid variable stars and white dwarf supernovae. And these are both important because we can use them to determine the distances to other galaxies. So the method of using a standard candle to determine distance is similar to what we had discussed before with spectroscopic parallax. First you need to know the absolute magnitude of the object or the event and compare that absolute magnitude to the apparent brightness, the apparent magnitude that you measure through your telescope. That gives you a way to get the distance to that object. Cepheid variables we had mentioned before in stellar evolution. These are red giant stars that are unstable and that pulsate brightness periodically. And so their period of pulsation is actually very strongly related to luminosity. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a graph of a typical Cepheid variable star, uh, brightness versus time. It, it is uh, very cyclical. It goes up and goes down. And Cepheid variables can have periods of anywhere from 1 to 100 days. And so compared to some other variable stars, they're a little bit easier to measure. In the early 20th century, an astronomer named Henrietta Leavitt was studying these Cepheid variable stars and what she found was that there is a direct relationship between the absolute magnitude or the luminosity of a Cepheid variable and its period of pulsation. And immediately this was a, a useful uh, this was a useful bit of information that astronomers could use to determine the distances to where these Cepheid variable stars are. And Cepheid variable stars are so bright that we can see them even in some of the nearby galaxies to the Milky Way. So here is a graph showing the luminosity period uh, correlation or the period luminosity relationship for Cepheid variables. So the longer the period of pulsation, the brighter the luminosity of that Cepheid variable. And this graph shows data for both Cepheids that have been measured within the Milky Way and Cepheids that have been measured within the Large Magellanic Cloud, which is very close to the Milky Way. But Cepheid variables have also been used to determine the distances to galaxies even farther than that. And so once we knew the luminosities of these Cepheid variable stars, we could use these to find distances to galaxies beyond the Milky Way and its satellites. So. Edwin Hubble was an astronomer in the 20th century, and he used this period luminosity correlation to figure out the distance to the Andromeda galaxy. And what he found was that the Andromeda galaxy was so far away, several million light years away, that it was too far away to be inside the Milky Way. And this was the first time that an astronomer had determined that our Milky Way wasn't the entire universe. So Hubble proved that other galaxies, other uh, spiral galaxies like the Andromeda galaxy are outside the Milky Way. So here is an image, a real photograph of the Andromeda galaxy and by using Cepheid variables that were observed in this galaxy Hubble determined that it was over two million light years away. Today we know it's two and a half million light years from our Milky Way. But what about galaxies that are even further away? If they're so far away that we can't resolve the Cepheid variable stars in them, how do we know their distance? Another way that astronomers can determine distance is by looking at an even brighter standard candle, and that is the peak brightness of a white dwarf supernova. When a white dwarf is in a binary system and it explodes in a supernova, we call this a type 1a supernova, and one thing that astronomers have determined is that by observing a lot of these events, they actually have similar peak brightnesses. And so I've got a graph on the right that shows the absolute magnitude or brightness over time for a bunch of type 1a supernovae. But when you scale them all together, when you uh, scale for uh, different distance factors, 
what we find is that they all have similar peak brightnesses. And this makes them very useful to astronomers because if all white dwarf supernovae have essentially the same peak brightness, then all you have to do is know that peak absolute magnitude, compare it to the apparent magnitude, and then you can get distance from that. At this point, astronomers have observed thousands of supernova in distant galaxies, allowing us to get accurate distances to galaxies that are millions and in some cases billions of light years away. So what about those distant galaxies? It turns out the Milky Way isn't the only galaxy. It's part of a local group of galaxies and groups of galaxies can make up clusters or even super clusters of galaxies. And it's these clusters of galaxies that are some of the biggest objects in the universe. So this image is showing you the local group of galaxies that includes the Milky Way, its satellite galaxies, which are all very small. The Andromeda galaxy is the nearest big galaxy to us, two and a half million light years away. And so the distance between the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy is about 25 times, excuse me, the distance between the Milky Way galaxy and Andromeda is about 25 times the size of the Milky Way itself. But Andromeda also has several satellite galaxies, and this is what we call the local group. But our local group is just part of what's called the uh, Virgo cluster, or I'm. S but our local group is just part of what we call the uh, local uh, local cluster of galaxies, and uh, our group is part of something called the Virgo super cluster. We have uh, in the center of this image the local galactic group. Um, so that was from the previous image, but now we've expanded out even farther into many millions and tens of millions of light years. And so where our local gal uh, galactic group is, from, from here out to the Virgo cluster of galaxies that I'm pointing at at the right, that's about 60 million light years. And so that's a huge distance out to the center of that Virgo cluster. And there's even more clusters and superclusters beyond this. Within these distances, millions of light years, galaxies are actually still visible to us through our telescopes. And so we can see uh, beautiful images of galaxies, in fact, even galaxy collisions like the one I'm showing you here. Here is a galaxy, a spiral galaxy that is relatively local to us. We're able to see its spiral arms and even clouds of uh, energized gas within those spiral arms. I want to describe for you something peculiar about galaxies and galaxy clusters. They actually warp the space around them due to the effects of general relativity. And what that means is, is that the space around massive objects like galaxies or galaxy clusters warps the paths of not just stars or galaxies, but also the light as it travels through that local area. And so let's say that we're here on Earth and we're looking towards a galaxy cluster. If there's a galaxy behind that galaxy cluster, then light from the galaxy is going to move through the cluster, but it's going to be warped and curved following the warp in space and time. This is called gravitational lensing. And so from our view on the Earth, we'll see that distant galaxy, but what we'll see is it imaged and squashed in several different images and lenses around this cluster. You can actually see this through a telescope when we observe very distant galaxies. For example, this is a real photograph of a very distant galaxy that we see an elliptical galaxy in this case. And then light from a galaxy behind it has been warped in a almost a complete ring due to the warping of space time. If we saw this through our telescope and we didn't have the equations of general relativity that describe how space and time can be warped due to mass, then we wouldn't under understand what we were looking at here. Here is a uh, galaxy cluster observed by Hubble. And we also see gravitational lensing here. We see the, the uh, images of warped galaxies somewhat in the periphery around this cluster. There are these uh, thin, wispy, and squashed-looking galaxies 
uh, there, and those are the ones that have been imaged. That's the light from galaxies from behind this cluster that is moving in a curved path around the cluster due to the warp in space-time. The image that I'm showing you here is called the Hubble Deep Field. This is a very long exposure in a very tiny portion of the sky taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. The amount of sky that this takes up is extremely tiny. If you could imagine taking a drinking straw, pointing it up at the sky, and looking through that drinking straw, you're looking at more sky through that straw than what is depicted here. And everything that you see in this image is a galaxy except for what I'm about to point at. This is a star, this is a star, and this is also a star. These, those are stars that are just close to us in the Milky Way. And it looks like there's another one up in the top left. Everything else is a very distant galaxy. These are extremely distant galaxies. These are billions of light years away. Every dot you see is a galaxy. And in this image alone, there are several thousand, perhaps 10,000 galaxies in this image. If we zoom in on certain portions, we see some that are spiral galaxies, top-down, edge-on, elliptical galaxies, a wide variety of shapes and colors. The image that I'm showing you here is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is an even deeper view with a longer exposure from Hubble, again pointed at a very tiny portion of the sky, and again, nearly everything that we see here, with the exception of uh, this one object that I'm pointing at and this other one, nearly everything here is a galaxy. Again, we're looking at many, many thousands of galaxies, and here we're seeing galaxies that are 9, 10, or even more billion light years away. And this brings us to an interesting and this brings us to an interesting uh, idea in astronomy, and that's called look-back time. Look-back time is the idea that when you look out into space, you're seeing objects as they were in the past. For example, if I go back to my image of these galaxies uh, in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, I know that they are 9 or 10 billion light years away. What that means is the light that I'm receiving from them now in order to make this image started on its journey 9 or 10 billion years ago in order to get to me. Light travels at light speed. And to go one light year, it takes one year for light to do that. And so these galaxies I'm seeing as they were 9 or 10 billion years ago. So what that means is, is that objects that are closer to us we're seeing as they were more recently, they're younger, and objects that we're seeing even farther away are ones that we're seeing longer ago, in, longer ago in the past. And so the most distant galaxies that we can see, for example, the ones that are in that Hubble Ultra Deep Field, those are much older galaxies. We're seeing them as they were very early on in the universe. This is a difficult and challenging idea for a lot of people. Look back time means that a telescope is a time machine. The further out into space you look, the further back into time, into time you're seeing things. I can think of almost no other science that allows you to actually look back in time. But astronomy allows you to do that because of the vast distances that are involved and the finite speed of light. So when we look at the Andromeda galaxy, for example, two and a half million light years away, we're seeing it as it was two and a half million years ago. The light from the Andromeda galaxy took two and a half million years to get here. What does the Andromeda galaxy look like right now? Well, we'll have to wait two and a half million years for the light that's leaving it right now to get to us.